Welcome. I'd like to welcome you to our last lecture of the Foundation's Art and Humanities series. It is very fitting that we have Max Orr from Carolina Public Humanities to end this series uh, this fall. Uh, and even more so that he is the speaker for the annual William S. Bretman Lecture. You know, we all know Bill, and I want to ask you to raise your hand. How many of you attended some of the Arts and Foundation programs when he was the director? Yeah, I figured there'd be a majority of you. Um, and um, so, you know, Bill started this program in the 1990s. Uh, he and Jack Cannon got it started, and this lecture... Um, has been held annually in his honor. Bill also, while he was um, the director, um, created a very good connection with Carolina Public Humanities that has continued today. And they have been, of course, wonderful partners. And Max is here tonight because Bill said, I want him to speak at that lecture. And unfortunately, Bill can't be with us but he still has his finger in, in the pot. Okay. Um, so to introduce Max tonight, uh, we have Joanna Flynn, and she is the Associate Director of State Outreach for Carolina Public Humanities. And she's a great presenter in her own right and has spoken here before. Now, she started her journey at Carolina Public Humanities at the same time that I did about four years ago. And she has been a wonderful resource and friend to our program. Um, so let's give Joanna and Max a warm welcome here. Well, thank you, Charlotte, uh, and everyone here for your warm welcome and your hospitality. It is such a pleasure to be here, as always, to see so many familiar faces um, and to be getting to reconnect with old friends. A huge thank you as well to the Foundation of Wayne Community College for years of wonderful partnership, to the Foundation's supporters and donors and friends, and of course to Charlotte and Emily and Wendy and the rest of the team that make the, the wheels turn so smoothly here. Now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Max Orr. Dr. Orr earned his PhD in modern European history from UNC Chapel Hill in 2008, and he is now a lecturer in the history department at Carolina, where he teaches courses in European world and French colonial history. And in addition to teaching, as Charlotte mentioned, Dr. Orr also serves as the Executive Director of Carolina Public Humanities, where he oversees a broad array of public programs, fellowships, and other initiatives, seeking to build a bridge between UNC Chapel Hill and the communities of the state. And in that role, over the years, he has focused on building strong partnerships, including the partnership we have with our friends here at Wayne Community College. Tonight, Dr. Orr is going to help us understand an important but often unexamined chapter of world history. In his talk, he'll be focusing on the Barbary pirates of North Africa in the context of the burgeoning nation-to-nation -nation geopolitics of the early modern era. So with that, uh, Max, I'll hand it over to you, and I hope you'll all join me in welcoming him. Thank you, thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, it's such a pleasure uh, to be introduced by my colleague, Joanna Flynn, who does, does such incredible work here. Um, I want to echo so many things. Wayne, uh, Wayne Community College has been uh, uh, just a real wonderful partner for Carolina Public Humanities. We have all sorts of outreach around the state um, with other community colleges. Don't tell them none of them are as important and special to us and as deep and as abiding as the one at Wayne Community College. Um, you know, especially with Charlotte, I want to thank Charlotte, Emily Bird, Wendy Potter. I see our old friends, Kay Cook, not old, longtime friends, Kay Cook and Adrian Northington here as well. Um, uh, I want to thank Steve Smith and Andrew Stoops also for their work on the uh, audiovisual parts of this. And of course, I want to mention just one aside 
Uh, we have people in this room who are involved in the Wayne County Friends of Public Education. When I say how act absolutely special it is for us to be working with Wayne community, it's also this whole community um, in the dedication to education. Phil Bedore is here, of course Adrian is involved in this as well. Um, it's a wonderful project by which this community is supporting your local uh, teachers with the Wayne County project. So it's really special to be here. Uh, it's also very special to be here for the Bill Bretman lecture. I met Bill in 2009 when I started working on these and he was always such a wonderful supporter of Carolina Public Humanities and he would talk with great excitement about what was going on here in Wayne County uh, and we were happy to source some speakers and that was really how we started this relationship. So this wonderful things that we're all doing here, this relationship we have with Wayne County really goes back to Bill Bretman. So uh, I can't tell you what an honor it is to be speaking here at an event that was designed uh, you know, in his honor and uh, with his inspiration. So now is where I have to tell you that this is not my core area of expertise, folks. Uh, as I was saying to someone, this is what you're gonna see is what I call a PhD level book report. Uh, we, were looking, we were looking at um, programming for the fall, uh, excuse me, for the summer for Carolina Public Humanities and we knew we wanted to do stuff that was kind of fun. Uh, and you might know Charlie Ewan from, uh, from East Carolina, who's such an expert on Blackbeard. We thought pirates would be fun. So well, what can we pair with pirates? So we're looking at internet piracy, and maybe we're looking at the situation off the coast of Somalia or something like that. And then I opened up my mouth and said, well, I teach an entire course on France and Algeria, and then the very first day I talk about the Barbary pirates, and Lloyd Kramer, my colleague, says, that's it, you're doing it. You're, that's, that's, we're doing it. So, there it is. Uh, I did, uh, for my comps, have to read a lot of Fernand Brodel's giant master masterpiece uh, on the Mediterranean. I've read a lot of adventure novels about the Barbary pirates, because I do like historical fiction. Um, so I had some head start, uh, but again, my entryway into this was from my own area of expertise, and that is the long history of French colonialism in Algeria. In fact, that is the course I'm teaching uh, right now and I, I gave this lecture one time uh, in June and I made my students watch it. So let's start at the end. So I'm gonna see if I get this clicker to work. There we go. So I wanna start at the end of Barbary piracy with the French conquest of Algiers in 1830. France and Algeria had had a long, and, and really it's proper to say Algiers, had had a long and stormy relationship for centuries, as we'll see, we'll go back in time. But they had had robust trade, and largely in the 18th century, they were even somewhat allies, um, if you can call it that, and you'll see what I mean. It's a complicated way of, design, uh, of defining geopolitics. But there's a story here. In 1796, Napoleon's army, he was young Napoleon, just a general in the French Republic, was campaigning in Italy. Many of you are probably familiar with the famous 1796 Italian campaign. He needed grain for his troops. He went to Genoa, he talked to Genoese merchants, and they said, we got a great deal on grain from Algiers. They got a bunch of grain shipped up, and not surprisingly, Napoleon never paid his bills. Uh, eventually, this debt had been part of uh, Genoese debt. Genoa was taken over by France, it became French debt. And the day of Algiers never forgot that France owes us money. So skip ahead, Napoleon's out of power. And the day of Algiers, the ruler of Algiers, is demanding that France pay this back bill. The king of France, Charles X, he is, uh, well, he's a king, he's very proud of himself. He's like, I'm not gonna talk to this guy. He's not a king, he's a day, it's another, it's another type of official, but it's not equal to a king. So I refuse to, uh, to work with him. And what happened then was uh, he sends his uh, emissary to go down to Algiers to sort of work out this diplomatic problem. And the emissary here tells the day of Algiers, this is Hussein Day, the last ruler of Algiers, he tells, my king won't talk to you, it's not, this, we're not even gonna pay this debt, you're not worthy, you're not a king, at which point the day of Algiers whips him with a fly, with a fly swatter or a fan. It comes to be known as the fan incident. There's scholarly debate, not really serious and important scholarly debate on whether it was a fly swatter or a fan, but the debate nonetheless. Uh, and of course, this gets uh, great indignation. I go backwards here, they end up bomb. This is actually from 1827, they bombard the port. Um, and skip forward about three years, and the next thing you know, Charles X in, in uh, France is having a crisis. Some of you might be familiar with the Revolution of 1830. Well, that's, all of that tumult is beginning. 
And Charles X decides, well, now it's time to do something about this. It's kind of like, if you remember that movie, Wag the Dog, you know? If we have a foreign war, maybe it'll distract some of these internal tensions. So um, they invade Algeria. On July 5th of 1830, Algiers falls to French troops. Incidentally enough, it didn't help Charles X. He abdicates on August 2nd, just a, you know, less than a month later. And there you have it. That's the end of the Barbary pirates. After 300 years of this, these people on the north coast of Africa, this is the decisive end. Most people will say, there it is. And then that's the beginning of my France and Algeria Accords. But I'm going to go backwards. What you see in this story, there are many of these main elements of the history we're about to explore. Of course, it has merchants. Um, of course, it has big states like France. Uh, of course, it has these pirate states that we're going to be learning about. It has blood feuds, personal politics between these two rulers, and of course, naval action. And all of these are attributes of the Barbary pirates. So we need to figure out what it is that we are talking about. Barbary pirates. Well, if we go to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, it's very helpful. When you look up pirates, the definition is people who engage in piracy. <laughs> uh, and you look up piracy, it's a little bit helpful. Uh, an act of robbery on the high seas, also an act resembling such robbery. Um, what about these particular pirates? They go by other names. Some of you might have heard corsairs. Some of you might have, sometimes they're just referred to in literature as Turks. Um, sometimes Saracens, although that is actually not accurate, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So at, at this point, I would ask you, what do you know, but you're all the way out there, and the people who might be watching on YouTube won't hear you, uh, some ideas. And, and so I'll say some ideas, and they might seem familiar to you. That these are Muslim slash Arabs, they're a menace on the seas, they intervene in the Western historical narrative here and there, but they always seem sort of like a side part. They're not sort of talked about in the geopolitics of European history as we learn about them. They're sort of disconnected from more familiar European developments. Some of you, I mean, many, many of us were raised watching movies with Charlton Heston and might have some sort of Orientalist vision of the mean guy on the boat, right? Uh, many Americans know our first foreign war. The upstart U.S. stands up to bullying pirates. From the halls of Montezuma to the... Now yeah, you got a little audience participation there. Uh, that's about the extent that of most people's knowledge of the Barbary pirates. And you know, it's not a bad place to start. They're all accurate. They all give us some sense of you know, position. We know what it is we're talking about. Um, but there's a lot more to it. And uh, first, we want to get to just what these terms are, Barbary pirates. And you'll notice I put these in the scare quotes, right? So first of all, we have to say, why Barbary pirates? And there's, by the way, again, some images you can kind of get, classic images of these you know, uh, Orientalist depictions of Muslims looking out, menacing in the Mediterranean. So the place, the Barbary Coast, is where we get the name for these people. This is, I'm sure, elementary. You all know this. Uh, the inhabitants of this area were non-Arab Indo-European groups that came to be known as Berbers by Greeks and later by Romans. This, of course, comes from the word barbarian. Uh, the place where the Berbers slash barbarians live becomes the Barbary Coast. So the name for this place already indicates a strong historical bias, right? This is the land determines the people. This is where the barbarians are. Mem by the way, these people don't refer to themselves as Berber at all. They'll call themselves Kabil, Shoe, Tamizap, other names. Berber is always pasted on from the outside. This area, of course, uh, has seen many conquests over the course of several thousand years, from uh, Phoenicians, Carthage, Rome, Vandals, Byzantines, Arab uh, invasion, Berber kingdoms that grow up, uh, the Almohads, the Almoravids, etc. Uh, and then, of course, the Ottoman Turks in the late 16th century. Importantly, this area was fought over between Christians and Muslims for over 800 years. Um, the majority of the interior of this area after 1100 is largely Arab population with smaller pockets of the original Berber inhabitants. But it's these ports that really matter, the ports of Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli. Um, and these become occupied and reoccupied time and time again by Crusaders, by the Spanish, by the French, by the Venetians, and of course by the Ottoman Turks. This is a, uh, an area of contested uh, ownership 
it is largely, however, that the constant is that even if there might be a Spanish incursion for 50, 60 years, the area always goes back to Muslim ownership and especially Ottoman. So this is, the, this is a key point, and we can quibble over it later. You can disagree with me. Um, I said, why the scare quotes Barbary pirates? And I was like, please do not use staples for posing. Please do not use quotation marks for emphasis. Why the scare quotes? And this is a strong contention. Um, and that is because it is my belief that they are neither Barbary nor are they pirates. What is the distinction? Pirates are thieves. They are outside the law. Pirate is a defamatory label, a convenient moniker for Europeans who for, centu for centuries really engaged in identical behavior, but they could use this term as an excuse to extirpate these people and to take over this land. These people themselves would have referred to themselves as Ghazi, a word you'll see up on the screen, you don't have to write it down now, I know you're all feverishly taking notes right now, uh, or holy warriors, and you know, we'll try to do so too for the most part, but you'll notice I will call them pirates again. Uh, these seaborne raiders that came out of these ports considered themselves to be law-abiding soldiers who answered to their captain, who answered to the le leader of the city from which they came, who answered to the Ottoman emperor in Istanbul, the sultan, and to their own interpretation of Sharia law. They justified their behavior as falling under the mandate of a holy war. So I have some four important points then that I think will guide us as a sort of, that's not necessarily an outline, but these are the points I hope will become clear and will provide discussion for us later. Some things to consider. Barbary piracy was a continuation of a type of seaborne warfare and trade interdiction practiced in the Mediterranean for millennia. In other words, piracy, if it's just the act of what they're doing, had been around in the Mediterranean for a long time, as we will see. The other thing I want to say, Barbary piracy was not an anomaly of the Muslim population of North Africa, right? Their piratical behavior was often mandated by their Christian adversaries, excuse me, matched by their Christian adversaries, especially in these early phases. So let's be clear, Christians had galley slaves too, right? Uh, Barbary piracy is inseparable from the concept of holy war between Muslims and Christians in the early modern era. These captains, whether cynically or not, believed they had God on their side. And perhaps the most important thing to consider is that Barbary piracy was also a state-run enterprise, akin to European privateering. It was not a criminal activity and must be understood in geopolitical terms. So these captains claimed to be carrying out state policy even if they acted pretty independently at times and violated state policy, they could always go back on it. Now, there are exceptions. Are there straight up pirates in the story? Yes, there are plenty of rogues who do not follow rules. But true pirates have no state allies, and that is rare when discussing this topic. Again, so lots of rule, rule bending, and they're engaged in very violent behavior, and violence, I might argue, leads to immorality. But if you followed some of the rules, you got to operate out of a friendly home port. And these last two points on the slide are sort of great justification for any behavior, aren't they? Just following orders or following my faith. These are sort of general things that I hope will become clear in the following slides. But first, let's go to the Mediterranean. There it is. You've seen it before. Um, a couple things. It's big. It's quite a large lake. Um, but it's also small. And what I mean by that is there's so many places where the distance between shores is close, right? So it's big and small at the same time. Uh, lots of narrow areas, lots of shore-to-shore -shore contact. It's, of course, always been, for world history, a pretty high population area. And, of course, um, this helps us get a sense of how big it is. I found this map. I thought this was really cool. Um, so here's the Mediterranean. In, on the United States gives you a sense of it. I love that you could take, let's say, you could take a boat from Chapel Hill, right, which is right about here, which is about maybe where Beirut is, and you could go up to uh, Istanbul, which is, you know, Chicago, somewhere in there. Gives you some sense. Um, alas, we do not have such boats and such lakes and such trips. Uh, but it certainly gives you a sense of the size. And of course, one of the things about this area was a bustling trade area, right? High population areas, like I said, large diverse trading zone for millennia. Now on this picture, these are very Eurocentric. These are 
European trade routes of the late Middle Ages, um, extremely simplified. Uh, we need to add thousands of lines to this, right? You add all the routes, so all the routes outside of Christendom. What about traffic going from Tunis to Constantinople, right? All of those incredible trade have to be added. Um, you have to add all the local trade. So what about just, you know, shipping from here to here, right? You know, all of these routes. Uh, that's why I call it a lake full of boats. It's got boats all, add fishing vessels, right? There is constantly commerce going on. And not just the famed goods of the East, things like spices, silks, tea, et cetera, or the high value goods, things like gold and other precious metals, and yes, slaves, which we will be talking about, but also mundane things like timber, grains, textiles, et cetera. And where there is trade, I hope this is not shocking, but wherever there is trade, there is theft. My understanding is that if the temptation is there, there's going to be theft. So we want to talk, before we get into the Barbary, we want to talk about real piracy, right? Piracy that is illegal behavior that's not sanctioned by any state. And it has a long history in the Mediterranean. I don't want to surprise anyone here, but the maritime industry in particular has been a haven for crime since the ancient period. Even ports today have issues with organized crime uh, running ports throughout the world. Piracy, again, uh, was often hyper-local, though. It wasn't organized. It often meant contingent needs, not a way of life, but some, for example, uh, local villages having a bad catch, and there's a foundering ship out there. So you go out and you take it. Or maybe you raid your neighbors, you know, they have better catch. These hyper-local contingent, not necessarily a way of life. And in the Mediterranean, another interesting wrinkle to this, this has occurred to me, and you can take this or leave it, there is a sort of mafia culture in the Mediterranean that ties together sort of Corsican, uh, Sicilian, Italian, Greek, Maltese, and even North African, again, hyper-local, almost mafia type of organization. And just like mafioso culture could be very hyper-local, it could get organized, right, and become bigger, and in fact could these what we might call maritime mafias that go back millennia could get so organized that they could wield considerable regional power, like our Barbary pirates did. This clouds the line between, say, a criminal network and state actors. So organized piracy should be placed in the context, I get to use a great word, in the context of Mediterranean thalassocracies. It's a great word. You familiar with this word, thalassocracy? Take this one to the bank. If you got a lot of if you have a lot of uh, S's and O's in, in your Scrabble board and you have more tiles than are allowed, uh, you can spell this word here. Um, it means um, empires or large states built on maritime trade. So uh, this obviously being the Mediterranean, there are many of them. Minoans, Phoenicians, Athenians, Carthaginians, Romans, uh, Portuguese, and of course a good example worldwide would be the British Empire. Thalassocracies exerted force on the sea especially through things like navies. And on, on the Mediterranean, when we had strong thalassocracies, uh, they periodically would rise to clamp down on piracy, on criminal behavior. But in the absence of them, as I mentioned with sort of mafioso ideas, in the absence of strong thalassocracies, strong fleets that can keep the peace on the sea, piracy could organize, almost in, uh, attain a sort of loose thalassocratic form itself and that it would be a, almost like a government of a, of, a, of a region. And you can see this is, these things would rise up, these, these groups would rise up periodically, all the way back to the 12th, 13th century BCE, the victory of Ramses over the, the sea peoples, who also are sometimes called the Sheridan pirates. Um, I, uh, I'm gonna skip the Greeks, but go right to the Romans, who had to contend with Greek pirates. Those would be the Sicilian pirates, uh, not, not Sicilian as in from Sicily, but C-I-L-C-Cilician, I guess would be the pronunciation there, who controlled vast areas of the Eastern Mediterranean in the second and first century BCE. Julius Caesar was captured by these pirates. And what's important for our study when we think about the era we're about to enter and the era of our concern is that the Pax Romana really clamped down on large-scale piracy for the full extent of the Roman Empire. Uh, it was actually uh, Caesar's rival, Pompey, who created a grid system by which he just extirp extirpated uh, criminal activities on the seas until the seas were mare nostrum, 
our C, right? Maintaining this. Uh, when large-scale violence and thefts emerges after, the, after Rome's fall, it's not quite accurate to call it piracy anymore. And despite the similar methods and despite the organization that we see, criminality was no longer the main object. Yes, it was part of the uh, tactics, if you will, theft, but it wasn't the object because something had changed. And after the Pax Romana, we have to consider the near constant wars of all kind are religious in their largely, certainly after Muslim uh, expansion into the Mediterranean. These kick up all sorts of organizations, organized pirate organizations, again, I'm putting the scare quotes around them, just about on every shore. And, but all of them are motivated by holy war. So outside of the local crime, which happens, again, small-scale piracy will always be there. People taking advantage, that's the theft but we're talking large-scale organized uh, violence on the seas. From, from this period on, these groups have to be considered part of the holy war. So Saracens, this word I used earlier, were Muslim Arab pirates routinely attacking the Greek islands and, and Italy uh, as sort of the tip of, of the spear of, of the Muslim advance in the uh, 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries. Crusaders engaged in the same piratical behavior against Muslim shipping. In particular, later on, after the Crusades, are not the heyday of the Crusades in the Levant, but the Knights of St. John were organized sea warriors on Rhodes first and then on Malta. And you read Muslim texts, these are the pirate scourge of the Mediterranean, the Knights of St. John. Ostensibly, all of this is part of a larger geopolitical conflict, all going beyond the norms of gentlemanly warfare, and, and of course, any one of these groups, any member of one of these groups can go rogue. And go, and go into sort of piracy. We can look at the examples like the Catalan Company uh, in the uh, medieval period that sort of went rogue and stopped following orders and became essentially a large organized crime group on the seas. We mix that with these blurry lines between who is a soldier, who is a mercenary, who is a pirate. By the European Renaissance, irregular seaborne warfare merges with the condottieri uh, mercenary culture you think of a character like Othello, Shakespeare's Othello, he was a Moor who served Venice against the Turks fighting in Cyprus. Right, so this is a culture in which people are sort of giving their services to different people, of course crossing lines even, and we'll see that's a real uh, feature of our topic today. Allegiance shifted constantly is ample opportunity for a pirate to find employment with a state in conflict. Ship captains or even admirals in, in Renaissance Italy of whole fleets would sell their services to either side of a conflict or go rogue altogether. Um, as we'll see again in a few slides, many of our most famous Barbary pirates are European ship captains who do this very thing and sell their services to the ports of North Africa. They will be called renegades, uh, but they again will become soldiers for Islam in their reckoning as their justification. Selling one's abilities to steal and to raise hell on the sea and sell it to a state is an essential element of this story. Another thing we have to understand is that this is not piracy. This is called privateering and was common, of course, in our own American Revolution, the War of 1812, was a common practice in every European country of the early modern and modern era up until the 19th century. It's actually the most accurate word for what the Barbary pirates were with the element of that religious part. So we can go, now, now we say, well, Max doesn't actually even mention the Barbary pirates yet. We're talking about piracy on the Mediterranean. So let's get to the Barbary pirates. We can date the Barbary pirates, as we call them, to the Ottoman expansion. Um, you can see this is a map showing, again, the expansion after the taking of Istanbul. You have, of course, expansion in the Balkans. But for our purposes, we're interested in this expansion into the Western Mediterranean. And this is going to be the area of most conflict. Of course, the sea battles happen all over, but this area, because of the obviously closeness to European shores, becomes very, very fraught for Europeans. I want to just, before we begin getting into the Barbary, I want to divide, I've divided them in my own schema into three eras, roughly by century. 
So those three eras would be in the 16th century. Barbary pirates really are an essential part of this great religious geopolitical struggle between the Ottomans and the West. In the 17th century, the Barbary ports themselves, these ports and the rulers of them begin to act more independently and their behavior looks a lot more like piracy and they still wield a good amount of, pi uh, of power. By the 18th century, they are weaker and have more formal relations with European states, but of course continue to engage in what we call piracy for their income. This first era of the three, the 16th century, especially, especially from 1500 to 1571, saw nearly constant warfare on the Mediterranean. There was not a ship that wasn't a target of some polity. This was especially uh, warfare between the Habsburg monarchy of Spain, Charles V and Philip II, uh, with the Ottoman Empire. After Constantinople falls, we see Algiers fall in 1516, Egypt uh, as a whole, Alexandria and the rest of Egypt and the Nile in 1517, the island of Rhodes in 1523, Tripoli in 1551, Tunis in 1534, taken back by the, by the French at that point and then taken again in 1574. When the Turks took these ports, the Barbary Coast became the site of their main naval activity. They centered their naval efforts in the Western Mediterranean. And then we could say the Barbary pirates are, are gone. I really say I want to stress this, especially in this first era, in this 16th century era, the behavior of these Muslim sea captains uh, was mirrored in just about every way by their Christian adversaries. Both sides engaged in raiding shores and burning whole towns. Both sides attacked shipping, stole goods. Both sides enslaved people, sometimes on a massive scale. And all of this was sanctioned by their states and both sides thought they were fulfilling a holy obligation. So if this brutal form of warfare was piracy and these people were called pirates, everyone was a pirate at this point if you were on the sea. But who were these people in particular? They became the legends. This is where we get the the big scary names that were often used in Italian folk tales down to the 19th century, they would talk about some of these people. Uh, Sicilian folk tales, Greek folk tales about the scary pirates. They tend to be from this era. The Ottomans' greatest commanders on these naval uh, excursions often came from conquered communities along the coast. The Ottoman Turks themselves do not have a strong naval tradition. They come from the interior of Anatolia. Uh, they were Albanians, Italians, Greeks, Corsican, Spaniards. Many times they were captured as children and forcibly converted, but adopted into families uh, and become uh, incredibly powerful uh, admirals for the, for the Ottoman state. They uh, would become pashas or rulers underneath the sultan of these cities, having almost king-like power themselves. And though often acting independently, as we'll see, they were always Ottoman soldiers during this period. They owed a share of their booty to the Sultan and they gave it to him. They would often have Turkish soldiers, I'm sure some of you have heard the word Janissaries on board, that were provided by the Turkish state. They had to feed them, uh, but that was a, a sense the official nature of their, of their piracy would, was evidenced by these Janissaries. And of course, they could be called upon. If there was a major naval action, you just sort of gather up your, your, your various Ottoman admirals who the Europeans were calling pirates and they'd be your naval fleets. So key players in this were the Barbarossa brothers. Aruj captured Algiers in 1516. He was killed in 1518, but his younger brother, Hyredin, dyed his beard in honor of his older brother and continues his work. He becomes known as Redbeard. I don't know what it is about beards and pirates and colors, but it's just a thing. It crosses both sides here. Um, and uh, again, just a, a, a legend, a giant. Again, captures Algiers as the first Pasha slash day of Algiers. Another one would be the great Dragut. Uh, he is, uh, the quote, the drawn sword of Islam, was another one of these pirates who becomes the grand admiral of all Ottoman fleets and also ruled Algiers uh, for a spell. A guy like Dragut's story is full of adventure, grand raids on Christian coasts, capturing slaves. He himself was captured and served as a galley slave for five years on a Genoese galley. 
Um, he himself was killed in the failed siege of Malta in 1565. These are famous people. Like I said, they're feared in the West. They become myths, scary stories you tell your kids, and painted as pirates, as instead of as kings and admirals and generals in their own right. But as you can see, in the Muslim world, they're celebrated, right? This is a statue of Dragut or Turgut uh, in Tunisia right now. So again, this is, depends on your perspective. These pirates, as I mentioned, going back to those points, were state actors. And I think it's really clear some, some of the things I'm going to show you point out how real politique could enter into this. Yeah, holy war. But this is also the era of people like Richelieu who are deciding, you know, it's okay to be allied with Protestants if we're going to take on our mortal enemy. And that's a good example because France and Spain were inveterate enemies, right, in the 16th century, especially over Italy. And so naturally, the enemy of my enemy logic prevails. And so here you can see Barbarossa, the big scary Barbarossa's fleet, uh, wintering for months in the port of Toulon where they were invited by the French king in 1534. Um, by the way, this scared the hell out of the populace. And the, the king said, you don't have to stay in, in, uh, uh, in Toulon. Come out of Toulon. The French population essentially left and gave the town over to the Ottoman fleet. When the fleet left, they left accompanied by a French fleet under Admiral Polan, and together the two fleets raided all up and down the coast of Italy doing the same thing that pirates do, the Barbary pirates do. So who's the pirate now, right? So one of our takeaways underlies a, a point that I wanted to make. This underlies this political nature of piracy in the Mediterranean. It was understood that these pirates were a feature of politics in the region, and deft players, European players, could use them to their advantage. And we'll see this, and we'll return to this later. Everything must end. So we might say the end of the first era, the great expansion into the Western Mediterranean, uh, comes with the Battle of Lepanto. Uh, this is, again, this first era is characterized by a tight relation to the Ottoman state and large-scale action. And the Battle of Lepanto, most famous for it's the last great battle between fleets of galleys, many of you might be aware of that, uh, was a great victory for the Christian fleet. It really um, ended the threat in the Western Mediterranean of Ottoman takeover. And of course, pirates were there. One whole wing of the Ottoman fleet, a third of all the ships, were commanded by a renegade pirate named Yurjali or Occiali, an Italian who captured at the age of 17, turned Turk, as they say, a common phrase for going over to the other side, um, and became a you know, famous, world famous pirate. He himself had a turn as a ruler of Algiers, and there are some great stories about him raiding the coast. Apparently he went to go and find his mother, and his mother at that point was old, and she refused to see him unless he went, came back to Christ. I love these sort of romantic stories of these pirates. Um, Lepanto ends this threat. It ends the, the sort of holy war, geopolitical holy war with the Ottomans, not in places like Vienna, but in the Western uh, Mediterranean. And so that holy war with the Ottomans is no longer really the context for understanding the behavior of these seaborne raiders. So we bring us to our second era, you might call the Ghazi state era. Remember, they called, would not have called themselves pirates. They were holy warriors. And these states come to be known as Ghazi states instead of Barbary ports. Our main ones that we're really in, uh, uh, concerned about are Algiers, of course, Tunis, Tripoli, and in uh, Morocco, we have Saleh. Uh, one other distinction that matters is that technically these are still Ottoman territory and are technically still loyal to the Ottoman uh, Sultan in Istanbul. We'll see that that gets a little bit shaky, whereas Saleh is in Morocco, uh, which is, has its own Sultan, is an independent state. These ports essentially become semi-independent in this period. Istanbul would periodically try to reassert some control, but never again could fully coordinate the activities of these states. So it makes it easier to call them pirates, right? but it's still not accurate. The captains, or reis, as we'll see the word for them, you'll see it up on the, on the screen here soon enough, they really never let go of their religious justification for their actions, whether they believed it or not, right? It was always there as a justification. Unless there was an agreement that was accepted, 
all Christian boats and shores were fair game by the logic of holy war, even though the Ottomans weren't putting all of their efforts into conquering the Western Mediterranean anymore. So these were, these were what we mostly now consider the Barbary pirates are these semi-independent states. So we're going to take a, a little step out of this chronology and look at sort of the height of these states in, uh, the, in the 17th century. Let's go to Algiers. Algiers provides the model. It was the biggest of all the ports. I mentioned the Barbarossa brothers were the ones who brought this into the Ottoman fold. They finally kicked the Spanish. There were forts in the harbor. They finally kicked the Spanish out of the forts in 1529. Uh, Algiers, if you coming into Algiers from the Mediterranean, it looks like a white triangle kind of rising from the sea. You call it Algiers the Great. It has Again, some really unique features, but what, I, what I'd like to do is read this poem here. This is actually where I start my course on France and Algeria. It's with this poem that was written after the fall of Algiers, but it gives you some sense of the, the way that people thought. People here were proud of the activities and thought about the ports. So this person lamenting the fall of Algiers. Oh, regrets, how the port was embellished with fortifications and ships. Oh, regrets, where are those captains? those billowing silken flags and those corsairs not coming to anchor except with captured slaves and coffee, those corsairs before whom the Christians were nothing more than women. I'm not going to touch the gender politics here on this one. Uh, Algiers was a pincer to pull, t pull out teeth. The most courageous were afraid of her. Oh, world, how was she taken? It is not this way we had thought of her with the Muslims of past centuries. Gives you a sense of the idea that this was a source of pride. Uh, it was incredibly diverse. Eyewitness accounts from the 16th century talk about all sorts of different folks, these cosmopolitan cities, um, Kabyles, Turks, Arabs, who they called Bedouins at the time, Andalusians, Jews, uh, Janissaries, like I mentioned, Turkish soldiers. Uh, one, and one account puts the number of renegade Christians, Christians living who had, who had converted to Islam at around 6,000 uh, in Algiers. This is around 1620 when this was uh, written. So again, this is a bustling cosmopolitan city centered on its port. It was a tiered society with Turks and Turkish allied Muslims at the very top. This, these were dangerous positions to have. Ruling Algiers was a tough job. In the 313 years from 1517, when Arouge Barbarossa takes over, to uh, 1830, there were over 80 rulers. And if you consider some of them, like the first Barbarossa brothers, lasted for 20 years, and Hussein Day, the last one, lasted for 15 years, and there are a few long-term ones, most of them don't last very long at all. It is a tough and dangerous job. Uh, lots of coups, murders, etc., and replacements of the day. I mentioned that in the 16th century, the Ottomans control, at least could control who ruled Algiers, and Istanbul would generally receive regular tribute. By the late 17th century and into the 18th century, the Pasha was a quasi-monarchical de facto independent leader, still occasionally paying tribute to uh, Istanbul, still housing Janissaries who also were becoming more local. Uh, after 1671, we no longer call them Pashas, we call them Day. Some of them begin to call themselves sultan, which of course the person in Istanbul is not going to be happy about. And the loyalty to the Ottoman Empire in name uh, is also several interludes of displeasure from Istanbul at the independence of these folks. How do these people get chosen? Well, they have this divan, which is a, essentially a council, and sitting on this council, were important people. The Janissaries, again, the tie to Istanbul would be the Janissaries themselves, even though they tend to stay in Algiers and become sort of an endemic presence, the Janissaries of Algiers. They would link up with the captains, who go by the name of Reis here, and they would sit on the divan together and choose the new day. And these days would come up, and if they didn't like them, they would topple them. Several of the ship captains become, as you've seen already, become the rulers of Algiers themselves. These days really only can control the Mediterranean seaports, and this is veering into the territory of my course about what happens on the interior of this. Largely, everything is facing the Mediterranean. All of their politics, all of their trade, 
their identity is outward facing and you know, it's at the port of exchange here. We can take a, a, a moment just to think a little bit about some of the, the details here. This is, this is the geek slide. This is where I get really a nerd out on this sort of things. I want to be clear about the, the, the race as well. They were excellent mariners, and they have all the same tools of navigation that we think of the age of exploration, the compass, sextants, etc. cetera. Um, they also change with the technology of, of sailing. So we, we start out with the famous galleys here that you're familiar with that could take as many as 200 men to row them, depending on whether they were one, one or two uh, rows. Uh, large, unwieldy, but at the same time shallow, could get into places that ships can't get to today, like deeper draft ships. And of course, they're not dependent on the wind, so that's a, it's a great for short scale. Remember, a lot of piracy is not going out into the middle of nowhere and attacking. It's right off the coast. So if you can get your boats out there, attack a, a passing merchant sh uh, fleet, these were great for that. Of course, as the other boats become faster, they have to make adjustments. Uh, one first adjustment is the adding of the sails and something called the galias, and the, the Turkish word for this is mahona down here. And these were really impressive. I want to say the most important feature would be these front features here. These could, this is a pretty um, modest one, but these could become almost like round castles on the front of these, uh, of these ships with many, many cannon. The uh, could carry, again, huge and carry many cannon. Eventually, by the, uh, later on, by the 17th, late 17th century, when we begin to, and 18th century, we begin to move into smaller ships, but also primarily uh, wind-powered, Zebex, Polakas, Polakras, and others. And often the ships begin to mount smaller guns, smaller gauge cannon and swivel guns. The main mode of attack is boarding. You get close, you scare them. And the other thing that's uh, important about this is you not necessarily want to kill everybody on board. Well, there's a reason for that, as we'll see. Um, and you also don't want to get engaged in a lot of, you want to scare your enemy to surrender, was a largely how this would work. So most common were small boats packed with men, many of them often in swarms of vessels, so this kind of overwhelm a passing ship. And this is certainly the techniques by the late uh, 17th and 18th century would be in smaller ships like these. I love ships. I started out loving history. My entryway into history, just as an aside, was Horatio Hornblow. So I don't know if you all remember Horatio Hornblow or novels, there's a lot of that in this. All right, so what do they do? One thing I want to mention, and I didn't, this is like, what do you add? I had a chart that showed how much it cost to outfit a ship, and I said, that might be overkill. Uh, it was expensive, uh, very expensive. Each captain had to outfit their own ships at their own expense, but the ships themselves could be owned either by the state or by rich merchants. And of course, going out in fleets was the most productive. Captains would sometimes strike out on their own too, like I said, they are semi-independent, but as long as they come back and give some of that money to the state, it's fine. Now, don't get confused. Not the Ottoman sultan in Turkey, but the local <laughs> ruler. The average crew, and we're going to talk about the height of this second era, was around 200 or so. Uh, oarsmen in the era of road ships, and the complements get smaller as the ships move to sail. They always had a complement of soldiers, janissaries, depending on the size of the ship. 20 to 100 of these uh, men would be on the ship to serve as the, as the fighters. Uh, and of course, a whole industry of oarsmen, right? It, mostly enslaved. And you do not let the oarsmen take off their chains to fight because mutiny was always a serious risk. You could actually hire yourself out as an oarsman if you wanted to make very little money and risk your life. Uh, but they, it, it is there. There are accounts of oarsmen for hire. So what happens, and again, I want to go back to another point I make about the religious element of this. And I'm going to say there's a lot of cynic, uh, cynics, uh, cynical behavior that's not necessarily true believers, but this, what I'm going to describe to you, gives a sense of the religiosity of this experience. In a departure ceremony, the imam would come down and clerics would come down and bless the entire fleet and bless each crew member. The day would come to represent the state. A sheep was sacrificed over the ship and the blood would be dripped on both sides of the ships. And the whole town would come and say goodbye to the fleet and wish for you know, good tidings coming back. 
When they were out at sea, again, I want to say often uh, lay in wait in coves. They would always do things like fly the flags of other nations, and before you think that's nasty and, and a mean thing to do, that was the number one way to fight on ships, even among European nations. Fly the you know, false flag. If anyone's ever seen Master and Commander, that movie, they have a whole scene about that where you're flying the fake flag, and so it's very common. Another thing that they could do, because you had so many Christians who would end up either serving in these boats, uh, you could always use the native language of the ship you're attacking. It's very likely that there's going to be someone on board your ship who speaks Italian, Spanish, French. So you could say, hey, it's us, we're your friends, um, and, uh, and, uh, and attack the ships. Coming back to port empty-handed was dangerous. If you couldn't find ships, you would raid ashore to get some booty and bring it back. When you returned, when these fleets would return, there was another ceremony. The whole town would come down again, the day would come down, the imam would come down and bless the, bless the ships as they came in. It was a uh, citywide festivities and feasting, and there would be a public divvying up of the booty, including slaves, and the presentation of the pasha slash day's cut, which would generally be about one-seventh or one-eighth. Again, this is a state-sanctioned practice. It's privateering. You're just giving some of your, your booty up to the state. But it's nasty business. One of the things probably many of you are thinking about, is he going to talk about, well, there's some gazi, but this is the salt there, by the way, is what that looks like. Oh, I missed some of these. I'm sorry, I forgot my own slide. I'll give you a sense. These are the things I was talking about. Slavery. Uh, yes. The first thing many of us think about when we think about galleys, of course, are the galley slaves. Galley slaves were common. I want to re reiterate that in the age of using galleys, all states in the Mediterranean powered their navies uh, with, with, slave, with enslaved people or long-term prisoners. It's brutal. You might have a rowing machine at home. Like, this is not a good way to get in shape. Uh, this is forced labor. Life expectancy was around two years at the tops if you were caught in this situation. Again, they were chained to the oars to go down with the ship because mutiny was always a risk. But that's only one form of enforced bondage. The most notorious aspect of the Barbary pirates, of course, is their high volume slave trade. Early on, the numbers of enslaved and single raids were in the thousands per, per year. I want to remind you, in this first era, Christians would also sometimes mass enslave whole communities uh, just like their enemies, the Ottomans, did uh, and march you. So sort of an ancient Mediterranean practice. If you remember Roman triumphs where you march your, your enemies in front of you, uh, that type of culture continues on both sides in this first era. But, of course, the Ottomans continue, I mean, the Barbary pirates continue this practice. Uh, it was a, primarily the main source of income from all the booty that they took. Uh, piracy on the sea was the main source of income for a city like Algiers, and slavery was the highest yield. Slaves were the highest yield product, if you will. A sale of eight to ten captured men brought in more than a whole cargo, a fleet's cargo of goods. Say five ships of their cargo would not be worth what eight to ten men would be. Raiding brought in the slaves who worked the shipyards and the galleys themselves, as I mentioned but it also provided most of the domestic work and unskilled labor in these port cities. As soon as people were captured, they were divided by worth. Illustrious captives were held for ransom. Uh, suitable people were saved for domestic servants or artisans, and they were separated from future oarsmen and hard laborers. If you were a skilled seaman, you might be impressed directly into service, given a little bit of extra money because you know how to use things on a ship. Same thing with carpenters. Younger women were sold into sexual slavery in harems, and children often would be sold to families who would convert them. This is sad business and a, definitely a part of this, uh, of this topic that can't be avoided. It's a whole industry of ransoming and buybacks. Sometimes raiders would stay on shore or even just go to the port where they took this and say, hey, we just captured your ship. Do you want to buy back your people? We're right here. We're not even going to have to take them back to Algiers. 
In fact, Dragut, that person I mentioned to you, he set up a special market on a small Italian army He's, uh, with thousands of enslaved people and then sent out messengers to ports all around the Tyrrhenian Sea saying, hey, we've got all your people, they're at this island, come and we'll sell them back to you. Sometimes there were prisoner swaps, okay, so that's one way of getting out of slavery. But most who disappeared into Algiers were never heard from again. There was a, an industry, however, of getting them out. Trinidadians, Mercedians, and other religious orders had special passes to negotiate for the release of prisoners, especially um, esteemed prisoners. And you can hear, you can see some of these negotiations for release. Now, some argue that over three centuries, as many as 1.2 million Christians were enslaved on the Mediterranean. But I want to be clear that this number doesn't account for ransoms, swaps, and it also doesn't account for the different types of conditions that they're putting on. Nothing exculpatory here, but it is some way of complicating. It's not exactly the same as chattel slavery. Uh, it was a real and vicious element nonetheless, and by the 18th century, Europeans were clearly not enslaving uh, people on the ships that they captured anymore. Um, it's, unfortunately, they would mostly execute them on the spot. So I don't know if that's better, but that's uh, no longer slavery. I'm going to skip this slide because I'm looking at the time being aware, but I just want to remind you folks that this world is the world of Cervantes, right? Cervantes spent, was captured and spent five years in Algiers. He tried to escape four times. Finally, he was ransomed. He returned to Spain and became one of the world's greatest writers. Now that is not guaranteed if you're ransom that you're gonna become one of the world's greatest writers, but anyway, this is Cervantes' world, right? Now, what about pirates? Like Max, you've given a lot of exculpatory thing. You know, there are a lot of real pirates who found work here. Uh, later 16th century European eyewitnesses who went to uh, the port of Tripoli counted out of, out of 34 vessels, at least 13 were captained by renegades, these European converts to Islam who waged war on Christians. Um, this is often a, just a career choice for someone who might say, my job title is privateer. I'm just finding a new person to work for. And often they were. Um, they took on Muslim names and the title for ship captain, Reis. And so I've pointed out a few of them here, Youssef Reis, Samon Reis, Morad Reis, uh, Jack Ward was, he was a privateer for Queen Elizabeth, converted to Islam, and ended up serving uh, out of Saleh and then Tunis. Uh, someone, Ed Edward Coxier, said about him, it is said was that he was the first to put the Turks to turn pirates at sea like himself. So again, this is post Lepanto and begins to look more criminal. And these guys are criminals, but they're privateering. They're finding another sponsor. The Dutchman Zyman Danziger, he was a privateer for the Dutch Republic. He stole a ship. Again, if a war ends in Europe and you're out of employment, what do you do if your livelihood is stealing on the sea? You find another employer. He steals a ship, goes to Algiers, he settles there, he marries the mayor's daughter. He ends up being called Captain Crazy for his reckless daring. He ends up switching sides too many times. He ends up being killed by the day of Tunis for being a, a turncoat. So there was a risk at being this mercenary about your allegiances. Another Dutchman, Jan, uh, Jan Junsen van Harlem, Moray Ries, was elected Grand Admiral of the Republic of Sale. Yes, there was a pirate republic out of the port of Sale in uh, 1624, essentially a leader, and he recruited his own friends. These are the most famous pirates of the post-Lepanto era. They are nefarious legends also, and they're the closest thing to what we really call pirates, right? They were pirates and privateers who went rogue and became pirates by becoming privateers for someone else. Uh, this also is where we have some crossover with New World piracy, so a fellow like the name of Peter Easton, who engaged in piracy off the coast of Newfoundland when things got hot on that side of the Atlantic, he ended up going and pledging his loyalty to Tunis and engaging in this piracy in the Mediterranean. It's what they know how to do. I have some great stories of these folks. Uh, here we have, um, yes. In truth, they, the Turks, are not very wicked looking people. Rather, they're quiet and well-tempered in their manner. It is if it is possible to describe them like that, 
But the ones who have once been Christians and have forsaken their religion, although they dress like the Turks, are by far the worst of people and cruelly brutal to the Christians. It was they who bound those taken captive and wounded and killed people. So this is, uh, gives you a sense of like, these are the, perhaps the nastiest of the Barbary pirates are the Europeans who sold their services to the, these ports. I want to point out this name here. Um, does not seem like a very Mediterranean name, does it? Well, that's because these folks also expanded Barbary piracy. Uh, so that's Olafar Egelsen. He was the author of that quotation. He was captured by Jan Jusen, the Murad race, uh, in a raid. The Murad race leaves Sali, goes into the northern uh, Atlantic in a raid on Iceland in 1627. About 40 people were killed and about 400 were captured, including our author here, and brought to Algiers to be sold into slavery. Um, he has an account of this. You can see, he said, the pirates were ashore so suddenly that the people found it hard to escape them. They rushed with violent speed across the island, like hunting hounds, howling like wolves, and the weak women and children could not escape. I, with my weak group, was taken. Uh, a ransom was eventually paid, and only about 50 of these people ever returned to Iceland. In 1631, the coasts of Ireland are raided as well. You could have a whole story, by the way, about piracy off of Ireland. They had their own endemic homegrown pirates there, but the raid on Baltimore Island uh, is also famous, coming out of the Barbary pirates. So not many people realize these Barbary pirates got out of the Mediterranean and were, of course, uh, far, far north of the Mediterranean. So it's this wanton raiding uh, that characterizes this second phase, this seven, the most piratey of the pirate phase of the, of the Barbary pirates. And it aligns, by the way, if you look at the golden age of piracy in the Caribbean, it's around the same time. Which brings us to the third era, which we might describe as a real decline, and also the real birth of the real politic involved in these folks. The Ottomans really lose control over these Ghazi states, and the Europeans begin to be forced to treat with them individually, and this has benefits and drawbacks. It just becomes a feature of political life on the Mediterranean. I love this quotation from Louis XIV who said, uh, if Algiers didn't exist, I'd invent it myself. Meaning, you know, he, he liked the way it would hinder his enemy's trade. Of course, he ends up going to war with them himself. This picture, by the way, is a picture of the French fleet attacking Algiers. Um, Oh, excuse me, uh, and he also reduces Tripoli to ruins in 1685. But what this does is it kicks off a sort of cycle of payment and retribution, treaties by which uh, European countries agree to send annual tribute to these states and are signed as long as they don't attack their own ships and attack their enemy's ships. What this is really doing, if you think about it tacitly, it's kind of hiring privateers, isn't it? You sign a treaty with Algiers and say, don't attack English ships. By definition, you've just also said you have free reign to attack French ships and Italian ships, right? You've, so this becomes, a, that's why Louis XIV is like, this is a necessary thing. It becomes part of the political bargaining of European states who are all fighting with each other. These uh, treaties, again, would often align with different sides. Unfortunately, if you remember what I said about ruling these cities was tough, so a new day would come on, he might not honor that treaty. So you have this sort of cycle, again, of of treaties and then retribution, treaties and retribution. You can see all of these times, especially in the 18th century, all of these assaults on these, on these uh, uh, cities when they broke these treaties or when they uh, seemed to overstep propriety. It was a stable system. We might call it kind of controlled chaos. Let me give you some numbers. In the 1790s, the Algiers annual tribute was 24,000 from Holland and Denmark each. 133,000 from France, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, pounds, 280,000 from Great Britain, and by the way, these are back then, so this is, I don't have the exchange rate, but we're talking a good amount of money, millions of dollars, um, uh, from Great Britain around 280,000, and three to five million from Spain, which gives you a sense, as countries become weaker and have wield less power, they have to pay more money for protection. Case in point would be Spain. By the, 18, by the 1790s, Spain is no longer quite as strong a country. 
Um, this big state treaty system is what exposes the U.S. merchants to attack. Right? They were unprotected in this system. Which brings us to the shores of Tripoli, where you all want to go. So America loses this protection. So by the way, these are, I think I show you some different assaults here. There are many, 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 if you look up Attack on Algiers, you'll find many, many different paintings of different European uh, fleets punishing Algiers or Tripoli or Tunis uh, in turn. Which brings us to where most Americans know these, these people from. America, of course, loses the protection of Great Britain in 1775. Algiers, why would that be, right? Algiers targeted U.S. ships starting in 1785, and scores of American ships and crews were seized, and scores of Americans were enslaved and put into this same uh, horrible situation in Algiers. In 1792, the United States Young American Government uh, agrees to tribute, but because it's a democracy, it's hard to get the money together and to get everybody to agree, so it takes a long time to implement this tribute. And this angers the day who retargets American ships in 1794. One cruise alone in 1794 took 10 American ships and 105 prisoners who never came out of Algiers ever again. The United States then agrees to pay $600,000 in a one-time payment $200,000 in ransom, and $21,000 in an annual tribute from then on out. This is a huge expenditure. It was the largest budget item in the 1796 U.S. budget. Payment was slow. The United States does not have the credit that European nations do. It doesn't know this system like the Europeans had known for a century. Um, so it's, it's always at the risk. This, of course, is why we have a United States Navy. In 1794, America's Navy was founded to protect against this threat. Six frigates were built, and unfortunately, because the day was impatient to get his promised pay, they had to build a frigate for the day of Algiers. One of our great, you know, the, the iron side, the old iron sides, the Constitution, right? You know, these ships, the Constellation. Another one was built and shipped off and given to the day of Algiers. All right, so other Ghazi states smell blood in the water. Look what Algiers is doing to this little republic, right? And they're getting all this stuff. So Tripoli demands a frigate too. And at this point, the United States feels strong enough and confident enough to take action on their own. In May of 1801, Tripoli declared war on the United States. Uh, and then immediately faced a, a weak blockade of Tripoli by U.S. ships that could barely contain the port. Uh, but they do bombard the port in 1804, and of course the famous shores of Tripoli is when the U.S. Marines uh, landed, they actually landed in Egypt and marched overland. Uh, does anyone know how many Marines were involved in that? I think we have a Marine in the audience. I always imagined I always imagined this was like, okay, this is the first U.S. Marines. There were eight United States Marines involved in that, and 400 mercenaries, and 90 soldiers who were under a claimant to the Tripolitanian crown, so they were already sort of immersed in these politics. Um, this was, of course, the first planting of a U.S. flag on forest, foreign soil outside of Tripoli. This uh, war ends with the treaty, in which ransoms are paid, promises are made. There was no tribute in this treaty. Um, I won't go into all the details of the Napoleonic Wars, etc., but in 1815, again, the Europeans have an opportunity to really put the uh, Barbary pirates in their place. Um, there was an action by just about every major state, including the United States, uh, against the, uh, against the uh, Barbary states, especially Algiers. This is, uh, again, the, I showed you some pictures earlier of the bombardments uh, in 1860, do I have a picture here? Bombardment, yes. Well, bombardment, that's, that's 1827. Uh, these bombardments pick up again and again, really clamping down on the Barbary pirates. Another thing, of course, is naval technology has surpassed the Barbary pirates. By the age of, now we're in the age of the great age of wooden sail, and American, British, French, Dutch ships, all of them are more powerful and are commanded by professional navies that are able to really outclass the Barbary pirates. 
at this point. And as I mentioned, of course, we go back to Algiers at the very end. Now it might become clear to you why the day of Algiers was so desperate for that grain money, right? The tribute whole thing has fallen apart. I'm gonna collect on this old debt. Should be clearer now. The French wouldn't pay. And then, of course, the conquest of Algiers ended this whole era. So I want to review, though, a few points that I mentioned at the beginning. These Barbary pirates were not an anomaly, but built off a long tradition of piratical behavior in the Mediterranean. I hope that's clear. They had a religious motivation and justification for their behavior, no matter how cynically it may have been applied. And they implemented policy and yielded state revenue, and so were political actors, privateers, and not just criminals. Now, I want to be clear also, none of this is meant to be exculpatory or changes the fact that these are violent, enslaving war criminals, right? Ending their menace on the sea in the 19th century was probably a good thing. And it's okay if you want to keep calling them pirates, right? I suppose piracy is like pornography. We know it when we see it, right? Uh, you know, but I will say one thing. It does matter what we call things a little bit. Anti-slavery rhetoric justified the destruction of these pirate states. Indeed, it animated all of 19th and 20th century colonialism. It also provided cover for colonialism's crimes, including bru brutal forced labor on a scale that dwarfed anything the Barbary states did throughout the colonial empires of Africa and Asia. I also want to mention the colonial, that colonialism brutality in North Africa itself, the subject of the course I teach right now, France and Algeria. From 1830 to 1870, the French government was responsible for the deaths, disappearances, and removal of more than half the Algerian population, as many as 1.2 million people murdered in 40 years or starved to death in that time. In the 1950s, the Algerians, who bombed civilians to end French rule there, were called terrorists. So pirates might be like terrorists, it depends on your perspective. And with that, I will take your questions. Thank you. And like I said, I hope I can answer your questions because this is my PhD book report. I, if you're interested in the list of books that I, uh, I research for this, I'd be happy to share them with you as well. Any questions? Thank you, Max. Do we have any questions from anyone? Well, I'll just Coming your way, sir. Don't worry, you won't be taken. I'm not going to carry you off. Where did the pirates, or excuse me, where did the slaves come from predominantly? The slaves would come from ships captured. So, and of course, you could raid, the very common was raiding the coastline. So raiding the coast, uh, and in fact, you know, someone like Uchiali, who went to visit his mother, right, would be a perfect example of someone taken at a young age and converted and really buying into it because they saw the opportunity there. So in generally, it would be, it's booty, right? whoever you can take from the ships, whoever you can take from, from the shore. And I will be clear, there was also a sub-Saharan slave trade that came through the Sahara. But that essentially dries out when Europeans dominate that trade from the other side, right? Yeah. Max, another question here. Um, good afternoon. It's not, not a question, more like a comment. Uh, you mentioned uh, Cervantes, like, Yes, a few words of I skipped over Cervantes, uh, but yes. I'm from, I'm from Mexico, and uh -huh. for us, Cervantes is the equivalent to Shakespeare for the Hispanic world. And you mentioned Cervantes as, as his world. Uh, Cervantes was, was also known, or for us, is known as the one-handed, or the manco of Lepanto. He was part of that uh, battle, and he lost an arm. Then he was captured and enslaved, and then uh, the, the Spanish crown paid his ransom, and he, he came back to Spain, and that's when he started writing mm -hmm. uh, several novels. Uh, the most known of, the, of it is um, yes. <laughs> Don Quixote. <laughs> I was like, I was lost. So uh, uh, Cervantes, I think, is, is a man, uh, a person or, uh, uh, of that era. He was enslaved, he lost a uh, hand in one of the most famous battles, and uh, he was also served under uh, the church in Italy, so mm -hmm. he was uh, a man of that moment, and uh, uh, he was part of all those uh, 
things that had happened to a man or to a person of that moment. A yes. slave lost a hand, uh, a privateer, a soldier, and writer. Yeah, absolutely. Thank Fascinating. And he fought at Lepanto, right? He was there at the Battle of Lepanto. From Lepanto, okay, I wasn't aware of that. He, he spent years on a Christian ship fighting the Turks. He was captured off the coast of France in 1575, like I mentioned, spent you know, five years as a prisoner. He was one of these people was immediately identified because he was from a wealthier family, immediately identified as a high value asset. So early on he was treated well enough, but he attempted to escape, unfortunately, and his compatriots were all hanged or impaled in public in front of him. Uh, and then he spent a year in a quarry qu crushing stones, tried to escape four times, and each time he failed. He spent two full months chained to a dungeon, to a wall, both hands chained to a dungeon. And again, finally ransomed and then returned to Spain. Like I said, becoming one of the world's greatest writers after that is pretty, pretty impressive, right? <laughs> Not a guaranteed outcome for all who were ransomed, though. Yeah, yeah, probably, right, exactly, exactly. I don't know whether his dominant hand was the one that he lost or not, but yeah, it's fascinating. As an aside, I've read, I finally read, I, I, I've never read all of Don Quixote, and I said I felt bad about not reading Don Quixote, but I saw a award-winning graphic novel of Don Quixote. I said, you know what, I'll just give that a try. And one of the things I realized, this is, has nothing to do with Barbary, Barbary Pirates, the only stories I remember of Don Quixote were tilting windmills, right, and seeing a sheep coming across a, a hill and thinking it was a whole army. Those were within the first 20 pages of this graphic novel, which was 500 pages long, so I'm pretty sure that nobody has read all of it. Now, anyway, <laughs> go ahead, please. Ms. Metter. I was curious about why someone named Jack Ward would assume a completely other identity. Was it to justify the antithetical Christian Muslim? In other words, if you became a Muslim, could you be violent with justification, whereas Christianity would, would say turn the other cheek or whatever. Well, I, I, think it's, I, don't, I don't think it's religion even that makes a difference. It matters opportunity. This person's profession is privateer, is pirate for hire. My Christian people gave me carte blanche to go do all of this nasty stuff to my enemies because I'm, I'm working for them. Now they no longer want to employ me because for whatever reason they've signed a peace treaty, but this is what I know best. This is what I do. So I'm going to go find someone else to serve and do it. Is it completely cynical? I mean, I, I can't judge people's faith, whether they, some of them might have become genuine Muslims and practicing and part of their life and very important to them. I tend to think it was, again, just sort of a cynical idea that you could sell yourself. And what a point I was trying to make earlier was that, you know, people like Andrea Doria, who is a famous, you know, Italian, uh, you know, admiral, these were of the same type of people. They would sell their services. Now, we, they wouldn't cross over to Muslim and, and do that, but this notion of you know, mercenary type of, of condottieri culture really is part of the Mediterranean lifestyle, and it helps explain these privateers who could just switch sides. Is it a big deal it, to actually fully switch sides and go rogue and become Turk, turn Turk, as they said? Absolutely, and it might suggest that these people loved piracy so much that they were willing to do that. But again, if you have a, sh if you have a port, you have a state sanction, you're even involved in somewhat in European high state, because I mentioned like Europeans by the, by the 1650s, we begin to see this process of buying off these states. So you're already involved in the geopolitics of this. You're just like Jean Lafitte, the privateer at the Battle of New Orleans, you know? Is he a pirate? Is he a privateer? Is he a national hero? Or is he a thief? These are these types of folks. I think it's, but I think I, I tend to think very cynically that they were just looking for a job. Max, you uh, have a question from your colleague here. Oh no, she's going to send me a she's going to send me a Carolina PhD question. <laughs> no, no, thank you for that presentation. Um, so I understand that women and children could be captured and enslaved during these raids on the coast, but I'm really curious about whether during the time period you described, women ever would have been on ships in the Mediterranean, or whether there's anywhere else where women would enter into this, these kind of power plays? M women travel too, right? So I mean, if, they, if someone is bringing their wife and their kids, a merchant is gonna go, say a merchant is gonna go be assigned to some port in Malta 
for their merchant house in Genoa. They might bring their family along with them. So they could be on boats that way. They wouldn't be working on boats, but certainly as passengers. And I think it's really important to emphasize that not all the slaves came from the ships. So you could go into a port and just, you know, it's Sunday, everybody's at church, surround the church and take them all, right? Um, the, 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 the plight of women uh, is, is brutal because it involves sexual slavery, just to be frank about it. Now, in terms of being worked to the bone and dying, some women might prefer, I, again, it's a horrible, I can't even say this exculpatory thing, it's, it's just a horrible fact, but my point is like, they're not in stone cutting sessions, they might be in the harem, right? Um, and children, more often than not, would just be adopted into families and just converted. Many of the, the, the origins of the Janissaries, I'm sure many of you know, the Janissaries were the special troops for the Ottoman Empire, were Christian children who would be captured and converted to Islam and become loyal to the Ottoman Empire, and a sort of esprit de corps that would emerge among all the Janissaries. By the times we're talking about, especially by the 18th century, they are not that. They tend to be endemic. It tends to almost be a caste within, within Algiers. But yeah, not, not a, slavery's not cool no matter what. Not good for women, not good for children, not good for men, but you, there is a difference in the way they would all be treated. And again, this is not, although crushing stones is obviously a form of sort of chat, like this is a labor that's going on. Most often they're doing things like domestic work or working on the shipyards, et cetera, or which is not good work at all. Max, thank you so much for thank being you. so interesting and entertaining tonight. Let's give Max Hoare one more round of applause. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Bill Bretman, and thank you all here at Wayne Community. It's always a pleasure being here with you, and uh, uh, we love coming out to Wayne Community College, and uh, hope we'll be here again soon. Thank you. Have thank a good you. one. See you guys. Have a great night. Be safe.